Back around here, if we have the mic on, or do you just turn this off? Um, no, you can use both. I'm gonna be behind, I'm gonna turn one of the two down. Okay. And which is the one that advances? Do we use the uh, this one here? Okay. Right. Yeah.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm John Nightingale. I'm president of the aquarium, and it's a delight to welcome you here. We've heard from a number of you how bad the traffic on George is, and that people are having trouble even getting to the lane to come into the park. So we've delayed just a little bit, and we'd ask a favor, and that is, can we, uh, that means we're going to have some stragglers, because this was a sold out full house tonight, and it is not quite yet a full house. So we can expect uh, people to come straggling in. So could we, to the degree possible, condense a bit toward the middle and leave some of the edge seats so people can slip in uh, at, with as little fuss and feathers as, uh, as possible? That would be great. It's completely out of sync with the speaker. You will greatly enjoy. Uh, Ray doesn't apparently remember, but I met Ray when we were much younger and better looking and that uh, back in 1983, and that, and I was doing a big tagging program for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and Ray had just arrived in Ketchikan and was selling fish. 
and that. So you'll see that he's gone a long way since that. And so I've got a few slides just to introduce Ray. Uh, he is a very accomplished individual, and so I really do take great pride in calling him my friend. And his wife Michelle is traveling with him, and the two of them run a uh, gallery in Ketchikan. So if you're on a cruise, go to the Soho Coho Gallery, and that, and you will be able to buy many of these uh, <laughs> wonderful creations that he has done. Now, Ray has only himself to blame for this photograph because this is from his website. And that, but I actually gave a lecture last year to the Long Live the Kings Foundation in uh, Seattle, and the entire uh, lecture for about 25, 30 minutes was Ray's paintings. Right? And this was the closing picture. And that, but again, that was his. Ray is first and foremost, I think, inspired by fish. He is a, really an ichthyologist and a very, very accomplished uh, writer in ichthyology or fishes, but his other real passion is paleontology and that. And so interesting combination and he has I think two books in paleontology now, and it was a couple and that. And what you will really appreciate in the talk as we go through is when I say that Ray is creative, I mean I just gave the analogy, if I look at Ray's pictures and I look at them over and over and over, it never fails to find something I hadn't seen before. And right, they're power packed, they make really graphic points when you see some of the examples. And so I just can't think of a better person to work on in a new display than Ray Troll. And just the gallery here. And I can't see what's at the top. What did I do here? Actually, let me go back to that because something has happened to the top. I wanted to point out that Ray is highly accomplished in awards. Uh, but since the other stuff is not up there, I will say the one thing that I didn't even know until talking to him today, in 2011 he was appointed as a Guggenheim Fellow. So there are not a lot of them around and he is certainly the only one that I know in that. So wonderful accomplishment. He is also a musician. And so he has the uh, I mean, Ratfish Wranglers. He actually has, and I don't know if the text worked out, on this either, but he has a ratfish, which is what's in the top left, or top left. He has a ratfish named after him in New Zealand. And I think the thing that is most inspiring is the little phrases that he comes up with, right? So this really does capture blues in the key of C. And you immediately have to think about what's he pointing out. And this picture is really about all the things that affect salmon. And this really does summarize a lot of Ray's pictures, right? There is so much to learn and think about in looking at that photo. Whoops, what happened there? So we've got a bit of a glitch here. Okay, well that was going to be a picture called uh, the Salish Sea. And this is a mural that is at the University of Washington. And Ray has done this really spectacular mural that is, captures all species of fishes in the Salish Sea. And that so, and since we can't see the last two, I think I'll simply introduce Ray and welcome him to Vancouver. And we hope that this is the start of a, a really exciting interaction with him at the aquarium. So. Thank you. Whoa, whoa. You be. Ooh, I'm on. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Well, it's good you get, didn't really get to see the uh, Salish Sea mural, but uh, because uh, he's going to steal my thunder. It's in my slideshow too, but thanks so much for having me here, and thanks for coming out tonight, and it's uh, really an honor to be here at one of this, this beautiful aquarium and, and to be one of the first salmon dialogue people. So, so careful what you fish for. You're going to get it here, and actually I promised I had all of these slides here, and they wanted me to talk for 30 minutes, so uh, I'm going to start the timer because I get carried away. And it's actually going to go off at exactly 35 minutes. So, <laughs> so I do have an artistic license, and uh, there it is. Um, Raymond Ratfish Troll, license type is scientific surrealist, pasty white male, 5'10", 190 pounds, blue eyes, big forehead. Weakness for cheeseburgers, fish, and loud music. And yes, this is valid everywhere. So I am a uh, lobe fin Darwinist <laughs> with a crayon. 
But uh, our tale begins here, and I'm that guy right there. And this is uh, in uh, 1964. And I was 10 years old, so I was born in 1954. I'm just about to turn 60 years old. Uh, I started drawing like dinosaurs when I was four years old, and I'm still drawing dinosaurs with crayons. I'm not drawing fish too, but, but um, the interesting thing to just share with you here is this is the big tribe of children that I was raised with. These are my siblings, the troll kids. And uh, we were service brats, so we moved every two or three years. So we basically didn't really have what we would call a home, but uh, it's interesting to note that of the six troll kids, the top four all found Alaska, and we call Alaska our home. So I moved there in 83, where I apparently met Brian on the dock one day. And I, I, no, I remember it vividly, man. No, it, it's like yesterday. But there I am, there's the picture of me, the young Ray Troll there, you know, and uh, hair and everything, and, and Brian was just right over there. And uh, I, I, so what, what you have here is you have an artist who has relocated to Alaska. I'd actually been living down in the Seattle area at that time. I'd gone to WSU and got my master's degree, so MFA, but I moved up to Alaska to help my big sister Kate get a seafood store uh, going. So you have a guy with a Master of Fine Arts degree, fresh out of college, and I'm a fishmonger. And I don't know a humpy from a hole in the ground, and I've got to immediately, because my sister has showed up, she left town, you're in charge. So there I was, vending fish. And I had to, it was a quick study, but I began to quickly just fall madly in love with the fish and the topic of fish, and I've just gone deeper and deeper. And that's the view from the shack there. And this is the town of Ketchikan. Actually, it has not snowed at all, really, this entire winter. We're just up the coast from you here. Um, so when people leave Seattle and they're sailing through Canadian waters and they, you know, they don't stop in your lovely country, this is the, uh, they're, they're crazy not to, but uh, they go sailing up through the Inside Passage. And then uh, uh, Ketchikan is called the first city because it's the first U.S. city, you, you know, the first Alaskan town you get it to up there. But it's a town of about 13,000 people, and uh, it rains and rains and rains there. Uh, you get about 35 inches of rain down in Seattle, and we get 159 inches on the average. So what are you going to do in the wintertime? You're going to, you know, you, well, draw, make art, you know. That's one of the things you should be doing. And uh, let's see, point that right there. There we go. But I had found myself smack dab in the middle of the fish culture that stretches all the way up and down the coast. And like I said, I was coming from a fine art background. I was a fishmonger. And I was in the middle of this. You don't quite notice it at first, but there is this powerful culture that thrives. Not only you know, the native cultures, First Nations cultures, but this whole culture built around fish. And I had found myself inadvertently part of it. And I've gone deeper into it, but there's every aspect of the fish culture, and let's face it, it's really driven by salmon. Salmon is this, this powerful engine that uh, drives the economy in so many ways along the coast, and it touches so many people's lives. So commercial fishermen, sports fishermen, the biologists, the scientists, the cannery workers, the, the bands, the musical groups that come up to entertain folks, you know, the, uh, all the, uh, the people that work and every kind of aspect of the industry. And later in that year, I, um, I kind of liked Alaska. I started sticking around. I like this fish stuff. And so I actually got a studio down at Silver Lining Seafoods in Ketchikan. And they uh, traded out my art for a studio upstairs. I did some signs for them. And in the wintertime, as you know, the canneries and the, uh, the fish packers, those buildings are basically kind of empty. And artists move in and go, wait, can I use that loft? So that's what I did. My studio was actually right above this. And there I am, the young guy, something fishy going on. And look, I always like to show that picture there. There is the hair, <laughs> the last of the hair. But you see me drawing on a piece of black paper. And what was fun is I had these fish ID books, but it was really cool to have my, my studio right there at you know, a seafood plant. And I wanted to, uh, if I wanted a subject, it would literally go down and grab it off the slime line bring it up and put a little piece of plastic in the table and draw the fish. But I was quickly becoming Mr. Fishhead. 
And um, this is kind of an amalgamation of um, sort of a blurring of the, um, my life at the time because you can see there's bits of Seattle uh, kind of in the background there. And my wife Michelle shows up right over there. But I have a ratfish on my head over here. This is an early drawing. And, but uh, I was also raised Catholic, uh, so I, I deal with guilt all the time. But I also got to go out and go fishing all the time and catch these marvelous fish. I never really had caught a fish much larger than a, a bluegill before moving to Alaska. And that's cool, and I always love that. But when you catch a big fish, but immediately there's this conflict that you have. You want to, you're so excited about this animal that you've just, you know, killed and the village is going to eat tonight. And then there's also, oh my God, I've just killed this beautiful thing. So I genuinely do, you know, feel this remorse. There I am in my mustache phase. And uh, this is upstairs at Silver Lining Seafoods. And this is almost an inappropriate picture here. <clears throat> but this is the first time I caught a king salmon. Um, and the, my very first king salmon was this beast, and it was 41 pounds. I fought it for about half an hour, and it was truly just a life-changing experience because I was just going through all these conflicting emotions, terror, you know, doing deals. If I only can catch this fish, no, I don't want to lose this fish. I will be, I'll behave myself. Please just bring that fish to me. So here I am, very proud, like I said, getting kind of weird with the fish. And, uh, but it inspired a drawing like this, uh, which is basically he held on for dear life because he knew in his heart that this fish was his. And so this is a charcoal drawing uh, from uh, a view from my studio in, uh, in Ketchikan. And actually this is drawn, there's a couple artist friends in the audience who are young illustrators and stuff. This is done by uh, rubbing pigment into the paper and basically removing it with an eraser. So this is basically drawn with an eraser. You make the, the paper nice and dirty and then you pick it all up. It gives it this very atmospheric look. It also, that same experience expire, inspired this uh, t-shirt. So there's the sublime and then there's the ridiculous. I'm not sure the kids even know what nookie is anymore, but uh, that's all right. Anyway, there ain't no nookie like Chinooky. Your parents will explain it later. My wife, Michelle, here on the right, I always like to point out, on the right. And uh, I met her when I was up there in 80, 1984. And uh, we got married a year later, spawned a couple of kids. But early on, as I started doing these t-shirts, uh, I started posing my friends like rock stars. So we had these fashionable t-shirt shots. But uh, these are some of my uh, friends that ran the seafood company. And I started printing these wacky t-shirts and I had found an audience. I had a printmaking degree, so I knew how to make multiples. And so that scene that you saw where I was printing those shirts, the shirts said, let's spawn. And I had printed one fish at a time in each of those shirts. I turned and I filled the whole shirt up. And I sold them at a, a local market that we had, uh, a short-lived festival there in the dock. It was all about uh, uh, seafood. but. Uh, I sold all the shirts that I had in just a couple of days. And I realized, wait a minute, I'm onto something. And actually, I've lost count now, but uh, I've done hundreds of designs over the years. And I soon learned, uh, you know, the secret of wholesaling and then getting them into other places. So they've been up and down the coast now, but still primarily in Alaska. I also have some outlets here in British Columbia, but. Um, I started doing public art pieces early on too. And this is a painting that I did of uh, all five salmon species, plus, uh, well, there's a steelhead over there, and uh, there's a dolly in there. There's a dolly varden over there. But uh, salmon in their, their uh, spawning phases. And this is a uh, painting that was, I call it Midnight Run. It was done for a, an elementary school in Ketchikan. It's about 12 feet long. It's an oil painting. I don't. Uh, do a lot of oil painting, um, but I wanted to get those kind of just great blends and things that you see in the sides of salmon. But I, you know, I had a, a, a studio right down on the waterfront, like I said, and I was able to go catch fish or get them off the line and just lay them there and photograph them, draw them, paint from them. There I am without a beard. Very short-lived episode of my life. 
thank God, nobody has seen my chin since. But, uh, and so I'm about to uh, give you every salmon pun that there is. And actually, maybe if you've still got a few, let me know. <laughs> the well is not empty yet. But uh, uh, if there's a phrase, uh, if there's a turn of phrase, if there's a, I don't know, I just, my brain is wired. But I hear things and they inspire drawings. So dog day afternoon is a dog day afternoon. Uh, chums, dogs, chums. Well, you gotta have the dog looking at the chum, right? So there you go. So here's a few dogs. It's a dog, eat dog world. So get dogs and they're, they're spiraling inwards. So dog fish and dog salmon and dogs. Salmonberry wine, fine table wine with a hint of slime. <laughs> Spawned in the USA. This actually was a wine a friend of mine made. Humpy birthday. Like I said, don't worry, be humpy. Some of these are dated, but hey, do I need to fill this in for you? I even colored it pink so you'd get it. All right. All right, but this is, uh, this is that uh, mural that I did uh, for the University of Washington. It was about five years overdue, but about 10 years before that, they had to told me that actually the uh, faculty at UW just said, we want a mural by you. And they tried to do the paperwork through the university, then it got too complicated. So then in the end, the faculty just got together and they pooled their own money, actually, and uh, hired me to do a mural. And uh, I was set loose on this, but basically uh, I spent a year on it. I just had to clear the decks. And um, it's uh, called the Fishes of the Salish Sea, and you'll see the Seattle skyline is up there. Vancouver's right up there. Um, and I was thinking fish is a Puget Sound, but I began to tune into the idea that, yeah, the Salish Sea is really, it's a, it's a better name. It's really, it's a real regional area, and it's this, this great, and it's, it just sounds so wonderful, the Salish Sea. And uh, there's a lump sucker looking right at you, right there. So there's all kinds of little things that you can find in there. And, uh, of course, here's the ubiquitous ratfish. And there's a humpy over there. Here's an interesting factoid, if I can diver, uh, uh, segue for, uh, digress for just a moment and talk about ratfish. Um, the dominant biomass in Puget Sound is ratfish, Hydrolagus coli. 75% of the biomass of Puget Sound is ratfish, solid ratfish. They've been around on the planet since damn near back to the Devonian. So almost 300 million years, they're just waiting for us to go away. <laughs> but uh, here uh, early on, humpies from hell. So uh, if you've ever worked in the slime line or been on a boat, here's Rousseau's humpies. I like that one. I'm an artist after all, Rousseau, in the Rousseau. But it is this incredible transformation that salmon go through. Let's see where my time is at. Oh. I better talk faster. Um, when salmon go through this incredible transformation, these beautiful silvery fish, they're like mirrors out in the ocean, right? That highly reflective body and uh, every scale perfect. And they're just immaculate things to behold. And of course, so oh so tasty. And then when they hit fresh water, everything changes, right? So. But it changes in an incredible, uh, incredibly short amount of time. They turn these dark colors. As they enter fresh water, they stop eating. And their bodies go through this radical transformation. And even their physiological features, their skull structure begins to change. Just in a matter of weeks, just they get these big snouts and they get giant teeth. And the males get really giant teeth and these big humps. And the flesh starts dro dropping off of their bodies and they turn into these monstrous beings. I mean, that is just nothing but inspiration for a guy like me. I just think that's, and what's it all about? It's all about love and death. And they've got one thing on their mind, spawning and making more and just this wild party in the river they're all going to. So that's where this came from, spawn till you die. And if there's one image in my life that I end up like, and even when people are trying to explain who's this Ray Troll guy, they usually say, he's, he's a spawn till you die guy. Oh, okay, he's that guy, all right. So 
This is kind of the one image that I will probably, it's, my name's going to be stuck with, but uh, you know, I peaked early. It was, that's all I had. It was, it, it was 1987 when I did this. And it, coincidentally, it was the year that Michelle and I had our first kid. So spawning was definitely on my mind. But, um, and it's really interesting to see how it has been interpreted over the years or seen. I'll just want to show you some of the places that it shows up in the culture. And that's kind of the beauty of printmaking and making multiples and putting them on people's bodies. And, pe pe you know, T-shirts are placards for an attitude and a sort of a tribal thing. But here's one that shows up in uh, uh, a uh, movie called uh, Chelsea Walls. And that's Steve Zahn there, who's yeah. right there on the left. And that's Isaac Hayes over there on the right, and this is, I forget this actor's name, but he's, they wanted him to be a crazy guy, and he's always babbling. <laughs> so they put him in a uh, central casting, got a spondy die shirt. Here's another movie called Cosmic Ray, the bad guys wear a spondy die shirt. Huh, Motley Crue, <laughs> huh? Motley Crue, this is Mick Mars over there. Yeah, he's rocking it. Uh, here's Charlie Musselwhite. This is from his latest CD, which he did. And look what Charlie is sporting. A man with taste. I like that. He's a great blues harmonica player. It's my friend Tommy Joseph. He's a clinket guy. He's a carver from Sitka. He was invited to the Bush White House uh, to, for the Christmas tree lighting. And Laura Bush is on the other side of the tree. And what's Tommy doing? I just was very proud of that. I thought it was very nice of Tommy to give me a shout out there. And here in the movie, Super Bad in the bad guy's room. If you got the DVD, pause it, because there I am. And we know you're in the bad guy's room, because spawn till you die is in the room. Now, I really thought that my career had peaked when my stuff showed up in a Ugandan action film. And uh, it was only through the miracle of YouTube <laughs> that this was pointed out to me. And some, one of my Facebook friends sent this to me, the return of Uncle Benin. You could freeze frame it, and this guy with the rocket launcher is wearing a Spawn to Die shirt in Uganda. That's global domination. I like that. And then later on, he loses the rocket launcher, and he's fighting. He's got a fist fight, and he's still like, wait, freeze frame it right there. So, and this is a number of years ago. It was already at 75,000 views. I was like, yeah. So I thought, you know, that was pretty cool. You know, Uganda in action film. But then about a month after I got that email, I got this. Somebody emailed me this picture. <laughs> Huh? That's product placement right there. Huh? Daniel Radcliffe, Harry Potter. Harry Potter is rocking a Spawn to Die shirt on Broadway. This was taken on Broadway as he went to his, the debut of his Broadway play. And uh, that's not too shabby, so I'll take that. I don't advise that you wear this, uh, this shirt in Kansas or Alberta, maybe. I don't know. Don't do that. Um, they don't take it lightly there. So, but... Uh, Da Vinci Cod, <laughs> Mona was a cannery girl. So there she was, Kawasaki. Sorry. Actually, when I hear you groaning, I will know that I have succeeded. Ah, here's just the impossible stream. Jam and salmon. One king beats four aces anytime. That's a new shirt coming out. Running with the big dogs. So then we get the dog salmon, of course, in there, and then all the dogs and dogfish. Return of the sockeye. I actually did this shirt in like 1990, something or other, and then it went out of print, and then we brought it back last year, and it had been out of print for like 10 years or so, and it went straight to number one. It was like, whoa, what was, wow, what was I think? Why? But I guess just take it away for a while, but it's also, I was realizing it's the Star Wars generation is finally old enough that they actually have, you know, they can buy stuff. Downward facing dog. <laughs> got to know your yoga, got to know your, your salmon. Rock and roll. You must smoke, please smoke salmon. I'd like to make, I tried to make him look very jaded. Yes. Huh? Don't want to bias you in any way, but yes. just thought I'd see what your reaction was. Uh, queer eye for the sockeye. Shows off the air now, so yeah. The, 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 the. Sockeye delic. 
So I had to wait. I had that idea a long time ago, but then I finally just had to have the time just really do this thing. I just really wanted to spend the time and, and just trick that out. And actually, Brian, it's my idea that I, I would love to paint this this size sometime in my lifetime, you know, so that you could, or maybe it could be carved and painted. Ooh, that would be an epic thing to, let's get on that. Hey, maybe the new scent, no, <laughs> that'd be great. Well, this is, uh, so I'm kind of into these, so, you know, uh, the 60s were good to me, you can probably tell. Uh, but so I'm into mandalas and patterns and that kind of stuff. But also I do some of that stuff, I related into my more serious art. And this is, this was done uh, for the Smithsonian, for the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. And it is in the Ocean Hall. And this is kind of a low res, kind of, pixelated version of it, sorry, but uh, uh, basically it was done as a digital pen and ink and with digital color, but we could output it that big. And uh, we can, actually it's being uh, in the Smithsonian, I own the copyright with them because uh, it's the Smithsonian. <laughs> Anyways, but I, I developed it with them, but we wanted to really show the entire life cycle of the salmon. So they gave me the task of figuring out how to do this. So the life cycle of the salmon. So I did it more or less like a mandala. So that it was this repeating pattern that went round, around, you know, the young. And then there's just this beautiful uh, symmetry with the, uh, the, the young that basically are born as orphans, but yet the plankton blooms in the ocean that are fueled by the decaying bodies, you know, feed them. I mean, what a perfect little beautiful loop but then all along the way, all the predators along the way, and that ping, get them at certain points in their life. And uh, including these guys, these are really wickedly cool guys, the dagger tooths. But I digress. There is no free lunch. You must pay for your place in the food chain. Whoops, did I? Let's see, there is a painting called Kings. So everything in there is a king, and that painting is that big. So yeah, it was another year of my life. But I had great fun. You can test yourself with all these things, you know. I mean, of course, we know that one. Yeah. Burger King, yeah. But, uh, but every kind of king, King Rider, Elvis is over there, King Tut. Uh, and I've been doing these pattern kind of things. They're just kind of waiting to be done as giant wallpaper patterns, you know perhaps in a museum or aquarium display someday. <laughs> uh, they'd look like that. But the other beautiful thing about, you know, being here on the coast, of course, is realizing how deep uh, the history of interaction with salmon and humans goes back, and then, of course, the deep history of the native peoples along the coast, and just the tremendous artwork that uh, it has fired and fueled in this whole co-evolution of the cultures along with the fish. But I got to see the Charles Eden Shaw show today. It closes on Sunday. You need to go see it before it leaves this city. It just blew me away. But uh, hanging out with friends uh, like Israel Shotridge here is uh, from, uh, uh, he's Clinkett. Uh, he's from the Tongass tribe. And the Tongass tribe tells the story of the creation of salmon. One of the versions that the First Nations people tell of the creation of salmon and uh, Fog Woman. And uh, I was honored to be asked to actually illustrate when he was carving that pole, his family, basically the story of the creation of salmon and uh, Fog Woman belongs to the Tongass tribe and, and specifically to his group within the tribe. And so I work with his family. And so at the potlatch, uh, when the pole was raised, uh, this poster was given out to everybody. So it was really cool to do the story and all the same characters that are on the pole that are depicted on the pole are in my drawing around it. And uh, it's a very beautiful story too. Uh, Raven and uh, Fog Woman and the creation of Salmon. Salmon to watch over me. Uh, and actually when I was at the art gallery today, I saw the Emily Carr exhibit too, which was wonderful. And I noticed that one of her paintings is called Deep Forest. That's what I call this one, Deep Forest. But this uh, is for the University of Alaska in Juneau. And it, 
is really about, it's a scientific surrealism. You know, the fish are all accurate, but they're surreal. They're swimming through the forest. But I really wanted to show that link between the salmon and the isotopes, the nitrogen isotopes that are actually found in the riparian zone, in all the trees. And actually, if you look closely, even in the bark pattern, if you walk up to the painting, they're swimming, there's salmon that are swimming into the trees. And there's actually some totemic salmon back there, but this pattern, basically the idea that you know, the salmon bring this nit nitrogen into the forest, and it's this back and forth thing, and um, the forest shelters them. So these deep roots, so this image too, uh, which actually hasn't been published yet or anything, or seen on the internet till now, um, so, uh, so this is the global debut of this image, uh, deep roots. So basically the salmon just sort of swimming up into the massive trees. And that's where surrealism <laughs> kicks in. Um, so here it is, uh, here's that painting in the lobby. And as I do often, oops, if I hit the button too hard there, we have salmon swimming all over the place uh, in that lobby, well, come on. Well, anyways, I'm going to let, I'll, in the interest of time, salmon family tree. I did this uh, image for David Montgomery's wonderful book called The, uh, King, the King of Fish, all about the history of salmon here um, in North America. But uh, David wanted um, more of the, uh, the deep history of salmon. And uh, I'm a paleo nerd. And along the way, I had discovered back in my plant, I'd done all these books in about 25 years ago, 20 years ago, actually, it was 20, actually, I actually remember now, came across the interesting and almost unbelievable factoid that there is an animal called a saber-toothed salmon. And I'm not making it up. I always have to say, I'm not, look me in the, I'm not straight face. It is a real animal. And this is the illustration I did my Planted Ocean book. And I've been kind of dialing it in more. And uh, if you look in the literature, and this is the case of museums have these wonderful specimens. And like a lot of stuff, there's stuff in the back rooms that's never been on display. I'm proud to say, finally, that after 20 years of po popularizing this animal, the University of Oregon, the Museum of Natural History is gonna do a whole display, and actually I got to work on it about the saber-toothed salmon, but about 15 years ago, I went down there to visit the holotype, the very first one found, and then this is actual bone of uh, saber-toothed salmon. Of course, the one that uh, I was looking at, the holotype did not have the fang on it. It had broken off, but there are fangs. This is down in LA County in the back rooms of the museum. That's one fang from Oncorhynchus rastrosus, which is basically a giant plankton feeding uh, close cousin, if not just split off from sockeye. So it's a sister species to the sockeye. And those are the vertebrae. That's the size of a marlin. The other fascinating thing is that Jerry Smith, he's a paleoichthyologist, has been working on this. The growth rings, one, two, three. Three years, 10 feet long. They got that big. Well, maybe I made it a little bit, but yeah, I'm, you know, a fisherman. But Jerry likes to say, Jerry Smith, Dr. Jerry Smith at uh, University of Michigan, he likes to say eight feet. And I'll say, come on, Jerry, come on, eight. At one time he said 14, and I remember that. So uh, and then he dials it back. So it's like, uh, he'll say eight feet and 800 pounds. They go, T come on, come on, come on, yeah, Jerry. But he's run the numbers on it, 10 feet, 1,000 pounds. And can't press that too hard. But here, let me show you. Actually, I do want to show you the one. The buzzer hasn't gone off yet. Here's what we did in Denver. But here's what we did at the University of Oregon. And uh, this exhibit opens in May. I painted this last October with my buddy. We came up and we cranked this painting out in about three days' time. And I can't do it without my buddy Memo. But we actually also sculpted uh, my friend Gary Staub. Staub Studios sculpted a life-size saber tooth. So it's Oncorhynchus rastrosus, and this is a charismatic megafauna. This is a salmon people, it gets kids' attention. It gets people's attention right away. What? Where were they? They were all up and down the coast. And they lived in the Pliocene, before the ice. They were creatures of the hothouse world. 
the hothouse world that we are rapidly re-entering. What is the future of salmon hold? We'll look to the past to see what we might, I don't, maybe <laughs> we're looking at something like they'll fight saber-toothed tigers like that. So anyways, I've also uh, worked with some other uh, smaller aquariums, and you and I were just talking about this, John, earlier about uh, smaller aquariums. This is a small aquarium in Sitka, Alaska, and they wanted to do a salmon connection exhibit. They actually, they wrote a grant, got some money, and they wanted to have an interactive game that would get people thinking about the predators and all the animals that salmon feed. So I sat down with a bunch of University of Washington graduate, actually PhD students that came up, and they sat down with us in Sitka, and we brainstormed for a couple of days, and we finally came up with this idea of a Plinko game. And then it was my task to design and build it. And so this is what I designed and built to paint it. It's all hand painted, but it's Spawnorama. Will you survive the great salmon journey? And it's just like, you know, uh, the price is right. And you put the little Plinko thing in there, ding, ding. And we have it shaped like an, uh, a salmon egg. And you can do it and ding, 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 ding. And all these are all the predators all around. Got a nice little label. This is it. My uh, buddy uh, Terry Piles, I did this with Terry Piles. He painted it with me and helped build it. And when you hit this, and it's a very low chance that you're going to hit that, you get to spawn. All the bells go off, ding, 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 ding. But if you don't, you get canned right there. And then all these other things. So you, it actually does have the So you hit those other things. So it is this great educational tool, especially if you're doing a thing with kids, you could talk about it, will you survive? And then they get to play the game. And it's a physical hands-on thing too. They get to, it's not a digital thing. And I really do believe in the beauty of hand-painted stuff. And speaking of hand-painted stuff, this is a mobile classroom that was done for the, uh, and this is my crew I work with, Roberto and Memo, Roberto Salas and Memo Haragi. I've been working a lot with Memo. We did this mobile classroom for the state of Alaska. We like to say we painted the uber humpy there. That is the world's largest humpy right there. And uh, here is a uh, bus that we hand painted. Memo and I hand painted this in uh, Ketchikan, Alaska. And uh, actually the, uh, the city bus people approached me about, you know, doing a vinyl wrap on one of the buses with my artwork and what that would cost. And I had to have a high res picture. And I said, you know, we could just hand paint it and we use these enamel paints that they use to, you know, paint hot rods and stuff. Durable paints. It's a hand painted bus. It's every bit, it's actually more durable than a vinyl wrap. It costs the same. Hire artists. Art, artists want jobs. Don't artists want jobs? Yeah. Artists want jobs. Just speaking to my fellow artists. And we like to show off our, our abilities and, and uh, we need a, artists need a stage hand-painted buses. So that's where this one was. Basically, they wanted the salmon run. They wanted kind of the visual pun, the salmon run bus. So here it is, the salmon run. So we just, uh, and this was, this took us uh, a week to paint, hand-painted everything. But basically, myself and Memo, and then we had volunteers, and usually reach out and use uh, students to help you, and also so do some mentoring. But uh, my favorite thing, too, is that when you hit the brakes in the back, the halibut eyes light up and looking at you. <laughs> so that whenever they hit the brakes, the fish is looking at you. So, and on top, there is the giant 900-pound flaming halibut. So this is a hatchery, uh, a hatchery vehicle that delivers little fry out. And so we, they had this little fish school. So fish, there's a fish school bus. So the little fry are being taken out. This is for uh, the world's largest sport fish hatchery, which is in Anchorage. And uh, these are my big metal figures on the back there too. So this is a 1% for art thing. And they, we had enough money in the budget to also hand paint the truck. So Memo and I and a couple of other folks, uh, a couple of assistants, we painted this last year, but it's hand painted. And we also photographed the heck out of it too so that we could output it again. You could do a vinyl of it later and just replace it because <clears throat> the, the, the magic of you know, uh, digital reproduction these days. But, uh, and actually this is where <laughs> Sam was clipped off there. But uh, 
these giant fishermen on the outside of these, this kind of big, ugly metal building, but it's connected by fishing line. And these things are about 15 feet long. They look so, it's actually, that's about life size there. But then they disappear, but I liked having these guys being pulled down across the building. So I do, uh, I do music too. I do believe that everybody should be in a band. You know, if you're not in a band, get in a band. Three chords in the truth. Have fun. Make music. F music is a real communal, fun thing to do. It's another way to interact with your fellow humans. And uh, here's a Cannery Girl song. And here's a little factoid I wanted to show that I did this song called Cannery Girl. And I want you to check out the YouTube video. And uh, Marilyn Monroe's first major acting role was as a cannery girl. It's true, in the film, she was packing sardines in Monterey, but still, Marilyn Monroe, cannery girl. I thought it was very cool. Um, a film called Flash, uh, Clash by Night. Uh, but anyways, this is uh, for the music video that we did. We had a cast of hundreds down at the cannery, and instead of the old man, I decided to have uh, my, uh, my son stand in for me in the music video, you don't want to watch me, so my son Patrick stands in for me. And with that, feeding the world. Sainers, trollers, gill netters, and long liners. And you may have heard about a little uh, issue <coughs> called the Pebble Mine. Uh, actually, my brother Tim is very active in that. And this is one of the few artworks, and my brother Tim is also an artist, and we did this one together, so Tim and I. So he's the more overtly political one, so uh, I'm more about rock and roll, and I helped found this thing, Salmon Stock. <laughs> and this happens in August, after the fishing season, and it happens in Nidolchik, just north of Homer. And we've had bands like Leftover Salmon come up and play. But it's a three days, there it is. Uh, what? two days of fish, fun, and music. Well, it's actually turned into three days of fish, fun, and music. Kind of riffing on the whole Woodstock thing, but basically it's a music festival built around salmon. And so I'm just bouncing these different ideas off of you about how to get salmon out into the culture. So there it is, three days of fish and fish, fun, and music, fish and music. And that was last year's t-shirt. And then this is the little gallery that Michelle and I run on the creek uh, in Ketchikan. And wait a minute, my timer's actually been going off. <laughs> oh wait, I went over. But I'm done. So that's what that little music was half an hour ago, I'm sorry. So there, that's my website and uh, so with that, um, thank you. Appreciate it. Listen. <laughs> uh, and also later, just to mention it too, thanks so much. Um, uh, I, we're going to do a little q and I guess, but um, I b did bring a Sharpie and there are some books out there, so I'd be happy to sign them. So. Great. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Nadine, I'm manager of public programs and my job tonight is to moderate the Q&A session that we're going to do right now. So um, if you guys have any questions um, for Ray, we will, uh, I'll repeat them for the benefit of our online audience and for all of you who may not hear it and then we'll get them to answer. So does anybody have any questions? Oh, and we can address questions to John as well or, yes. or Brian from PSF as well. And I have a hard time seeing, so I'll just have to cover my eyes, but. I hope it didn't go way over there. <laughs> Did All I go right. way over? I have one from the front here. Okay. Do I have to turn my mic on or? Oh, you can turn She's it on, sure. repeat it. I can repeat it, or you can turn your mic on and then everyone will hear. That's fine. I just lead it off then, Ray. Um, as you know, this is partly about developing a new display for the aquarium over the next couple of years. And, and you've done a variety of displays all over the world. And I'm just wondering, what would you think is the key thing to really catch people's attention in a display? And uh, so just can you give us a little bit of advice from your experience? I'll just, I'll repeat it. It was loud, but I'll repeat it. So what is the key thing to put in a display to attract an audience? Well, <laughs> with salmon, is that the particular question? Well, I think um, 
uh, people in the aquarium biz will know that it's, it's, it's tough. Um, people see salmon quite a bit, right, uh, here on the coast, and they're honestly, you have to be creative about ways to actually display the living creature. So that's a challenge because, you know, they're, um, um, they're not really weird. They don't have that weird factor. The wow factor is kind of harder. So the challenge is up, I think, to the Aquarius to really design a tank. Um, and there's beautiful tanks here that, uh, you know, the animal itself is displayed in a really dynamic and interesting way. So there's the challenge of, you know, the, just keep the biology, the salmon too, because they are this, the fresh water going salt water. So there's lots of challenges that, you know, aquarium folks could address. And I can't really address those so much other than you can be creative about uh, ways that you can interact with the tank or you go under the tank or you, the fish are above you or below you. Every kind of experiment has been, been done with uh, fish in aquariums. But I would just encourage, um, you know, the, the cultural interaction on the coast here has been so deep. And there's just so many aspects uh, and as, that you can hit on. And basically, it's all the dynamics, the surrounding. Um, so I believe in, in uh, big visual art, in engulfing visual art, you know, so murals that you can step into or walk inside of, massive sculptures. But I think people are, are also, uh, that's why I keep talking about the validity of, of a painted thing or a carved thing or a hand carved thing. Uh, we're used to seeing big digital outputs now. We know a painted surface, I know in particular, but I think you know the average guy does too. You're not usually, you really, you could feel craftsmanship in the room. So I think, you know, really interacting art, art and science, and I always like to, you know, even music, you know, there's just different ways to, we're very uh, sensual creatures and we operate on every sense level, you know, so, so, you, I think in a big public settings, you need to hit on every level that you can. And there's a lot of compartmentalizing that happens in the world. You're an artist, you're not a scientist, or you know, or the, we have science over here and we have fun over here. We only listen to music over here. No, break down the barriers between those because at every level we, we, uh, we react at every level. I went on and on, didn't I? So. I digress. All right. Do we have any more questions from our all right, the lady in the back with the red top? So the question is what caused the extinction of the saber-toothed salmon? Well, I always like to qualify it. I'm an artist. So uh, but like I said, break down the barriers. I'm also a bit of a scientist. So uh, the science part of me, um, uh, you can always, you, you got to theorize, of course, about the past. You can't, we know there were no witnesses. But you can start put two, two, two and two together and see what happened and, and make a reasonable assumption, I think, or a hypothesis. And you can begin to test that scientifically. But uh, basically, big animals are very vulnerable, right? So they're very vulnerable. They need a lot to sustain these big bodies and stuff. Even though it's a plankton feeder, it's going right to the, food, the, the base of the food chain, right? It's, it's living off of plankton. So it's, a pretty, it's not a lot of steps in between. But yet they're sensitive to environmental changes. And there was a huge environmental change at the end of the Pliocene. And it was in the opposite mode. This is why the study of the past is really so relevant to what we're facing in the future. Um, because at the end of the Pliocene, there's a big thing called ice started moving down. And the water levels in the planet changed rapidly. And these massive fish, I mean massive anadromous fish, they were spawning in the rivers, but they were big, wide open rivers. And they're spawning, and we know that they were freshwater fish, because their uh, saber-toothed salmon uh, populations are found in Idaho. But then there's really interesting uh, uh, populations too that uh, actually became isolated and were like sockeye in the lakes and they turned into dwarfs. So there were dwarf 
saber-toothed salmon, little tiny saber-toothed. They were so cute, and uh, but they have these very distinctive jaws. But uh, and as an artist, that's why I just love uh, uh, riffing on an animal like the saber-toothed salmon. Nobody's really done much about it, and I'm helping to popularize it. And maybe those kind of questions will be uh, answered when people start looking at well, what happened in that extinction cycle. But it was a very different ocean then. But it was a very, it was a much warmer world and very rich in plankton, but then it all changed, changed rapidly. And we are seeing a change in the planet now within our lifetimes that is just stunning. And we're seeing the, the natural world adapting as quick as it can. So, and we should not forget that we're in the chain, you know, so it's going to affect us. I have one question from our YouTube audience. Oh, okay. As an artist, how do you keep it fresh? <laughs> I ran out of ideas a long time ago. Um, how do I keep it fresh? Um, well, I don't know. If you're an artist, then you're continuously kind of, um, you can't shut it off sometimes, you know? because your brain starts operating on all these different levels. But, um, and I think that creative people are literally probably wired differently uh, and that we do get input on these different levels. But that said too, I live on an island, um, but I like to get out in the world and actually as an artist, as an isolated artist, you know, usually what happens with an artist, you know, you're basically alone in the, alone in the studio, all those, you know, you become almost, you have to get out of the studio. And I really have these two lives that I lead, and one is as a public person, but then most of my life is spent alone, and I need that alone time. So I say get out in the world and actually interact with scientists and other, you know, musicians, and you know, and actually it was a big step for me to start hanging out with people like, uh, like Brian. Uh, with PhDs and I'm just an artist guy and I can't speak the language but I actually learned that, that they're friendly and they want people to talk to them <laughs> you know and uh, they need people to talk to them because they're quiet scientists and they need somebody like me to help get the word out so yeah keep it fresh just get out travel interact and yeah One more? Okay. One more question okay All right, so the question is, how will global warming affect the salmon? Um, I was surprised that when Dr. Jerry Smith, uh, he came up and gave a talk about the evolution of salmon. And uh, what he said surprised me, because he was the guy who'd done all the work in the saber-toothed salmon and all these Miocene and Pliocene and the deep history of salmon. And he was talking about, you know, the, these were very resilient fish. They're remarkably resilient. And I'm not sure that I buy that. I mean, I, I think we've seen in our life, in our lifetimes and, and historically, we've seen uh, some just catastrophic mistakes. We know this, Brian can speak to it. But uh, you know, with the canneries and uh, all the fish traps early on in the 30s and just the almost complete annihilation of runs. And we, we like to think that, at least in Alaska and here in British Columbia, that we learned that lesson and we dialed it back. So I think that um, global warming is, it's definitely gonna affect the fisheries. Uh, it's, but it remains to be seen. Uh, I, this is, these species of salmon that we have now have co-evolved with ice and forests and temperate rainforests. And we're seeing radical climate change. Um, uh, yeah, and I know right now there's no snowpack in Ketchikan. And it's hardly snow, it's like we had a half an inch of snow on the ground this winter and that's it. And there's really, there's no snowpack. And I know that's going to be, we're going to, we're going to see effects from that almost immediately. So, I don't know. I fear for the planet. 
but uh, and I fear for our little finny friends. But uh, um, uh, I like to think that artists are the canaries in the coal mine, and uh, and we do what we can to make raise awareness. Uh, but we also uh, uh, maybe help inspire scientists or uh, to get get the answers for us. Okay, um, thanks for the Q and A, and I'll turn the mic over to John. Thanks. Just before we close, because we're going to adjourn to a reception, there's plenty of time to talk and, and ask the great questions in a little more informal environment. But we have a question for all of you, and, and as we've talked about salmon dialogues. Uh, course, being scientists, we said, well, we have to get some science, salmon scientists in here to talk about ecology or biology. Uh, but then after, a, you know, when, when Ray became the first, uh, the first salmon dialogue person, we thought, well, that's not exactly uh, your vision of a fisheries and ocean scientist. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> when we, uh, in June, when we opened the, the uh, new front end of the aquarium, we got a, a big a big space that's uh, concert quality. So we thought, okay, well, maybe we, you know, if, if people are interested, salmon art, salmon music, salmon food, salmon cooking, salmon economists. Um, so as you, uh, as you think about uh, us trying to unfold uh, salmon dialogues going forward, any suggestions are gratefully received. Um, but I think we're kind of thinking a little more off the wall and a little less Academic life, maybe, um, if, if, uh, if that keeps everybody's uh, satisfaction. And then I'm going to let, uh, let Brian finish by thanking Ray. Were you saying Ray is academic? <laughs> I just, how low are we going? <laughs> that, uh, so. Well, Ray, I just wanted to say a personal thank you to you. I think everybody can see why I did the introduction in terms of creativity and <clears throat> that. Uh, I want to file a complaint, though. Oh, I'm sorry. And that. So you have restored certain T-shirts, but not my favorite. Oh, no. All right. So you showed it. So I really would like to see you bring back, don't worry, be humpy. <laughs> right. So I wore the shirt off my back, and my, my dear wife threw it out because she thought it was a rag. Oh. Right. So very close to a divorce at the point. Never mind. Oh, no. So surely you could bring that back because I'm sure it was a big one. You oh. can use waterproof clothing, but this will suffice. I'm sure you can use it in Alaska. And wow. You can, you can show off the symbol so people will know who we are. So do I, do I get it? No, I owe you a Don't Worry Be Humpy shirt now. Absolutely. Is that the thing? <laughs> See how quick so you picked it up? Nut. I've picked it up. Well, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Sincere. And Thanks. Michelle, thank you for coming. Thanks. It's going to be outside.